occurred to me kind of going into this Thanksgiving week that sometimes we take things for granted. We take friendships for granted. Sometimes we, we, we take the liberties and the freedoms we have in our nation for granted. If you've had a chance to travel and if you've been to other places, I've been to Cuba a few times and I'm just telling you, if they had the freedoms that we would have, they would be a lot more grateful perhaps than you or I. And where there's so much that we take for granted that we don't really think about it, and we think of the, our comfortable homes with air condition and heat, a car that drives us around. It might not be the nicest car, it might not be the new, newest car, but it gets you around. Think of it, we, we have food in our pantries. Might not be what we want to eat, but, but there's food in our pantries. There's so much to be grateful for in our lives today. We, we can be grateful for running water. We can be grateful for non-essential things like television and streaming services. We, we have more than what we realize we actually have, and yet sometimes we're so ungrateful, and we feel like there's nothing to be grateful for. So if you've ever asked the question, maybe in this season, and people are posting things that they're thankful for, and you started maybe a post like, I am grateful for, and then you sat there for like five minutes and didn't have anything to write, I just want to help us all understand there's more to be grateful for than what you or I actually realize. And it seemed important enough to me to land on this attitude of gratefulness to spend a few weeks discussing what the Bible has to say about a grateful heart. And I think the 103rd Psalm puts it so, so well. So that's where we're going to be today. If you want to open up your Bibles to Psalm 103, and we're going to pull the emergency break up and we're going to stay there. There's more than what we have time to cover in our time together, but we're going to really zoom in on the first five verses of Psalm 103, the first five verses there. And it begins with this phrase, and it's a phrase that becomes the theme of the psalm, and it's a phrase that reoccurs and it reappears over and over and over. It starts in verse 1, it says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Then verse 2 has the same identical phrase. Then in verse 20, it says, bless the Lord, O you angels. And then in verse 21, bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. That's you and me, like we're the ones who are doing the will of God. In verse 22, it appears twice. So six times in this one psalm, the theme, bless the Lord, continues to show up. So what does it really mean? Because it seems rather important when it shows up six times. And so David begins with this command, and and let's put it up on the screen, and and perhaps let's read it out loud together. And so verse 1 says, let's read it together. Ready? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So If you understand sentence structure, uh, this is a command that David is speaking to his soul to do something. And the thing to do is to bless. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And there's no qualifiers on it. It doesn't say bless the Lord when things go good. It doesn't say bless the Lord when things are going the way you plan for them. It doesn't say bless the Lord when you live in the lap of luxury and affluence. It doesn't say bless the Lord when you're in a good mood. It doesn't say bless the Lord when you're happy and content. It doesn't say, there's no qualifiers. So let me say it this way. When you're moody, bless the Lord. When you're sad, bless the Lord. When you're grumpy, bless the Lord. Some of you are looking at your spouse right now. When you're hungry and your stomach's growling, bless the Lord. When you're awake in the middle of the night and you can't sleep and you're staring at the ceiling fan going round and round, bless the Lord. When you're trying to pay bills and you don't know if you're going to have enough money to cover all of them, bless the Lord. You see, there's no qualifiers on it. Your life doesn't have to be going perfect to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my God. So so it starts with this command that David is looking inwardly, and we don't know if he was having a good day or if he was having a bad day when he wrote this, but he writes this to himself, and he's writing it to us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. 
and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So here's a good place to ask a question. What does it mean to bless the Lord? Well, we bless the Lord by praising him. Write that down in your notes somewhere. We bless the Lord by praising him. To bless the Lord means to exalt his name, to focus on him, to have so much focus on him that your actual life is an afterthought. To see him so big, you don't really see yourself, that you get lost in his presence by exalting him and remembering who he is. And then David gives himself another command, and this is in verse 2. And it starts with the exact same words, bless the Lord, O my soul. And now he changes and he says, and forget not all his benefits. Underline that or circle that in your Bible, and forget not all his benefits. What do you, what do you call a person who forgets all the good things that somebody has done for them? What, what do you... What are you if, if, you're, if someone does nice things or good things for you and you just forget about them? What's the word we use for that? The word I think we use for that is ungrateful. And this verse came to my mind when I was thinking about forgetting all of the benefits of God. I was wondering, is, is this something that's common in our day today, this attitude of ungratefulness or ingratitude? Is that something that characterizes our world today? And in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think Paul's writing, and it's kind of a commentary even on our world today about a sad characteristic that we find. And he's talking about the last days. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, uh-oh. And then on the list, ungrateful. You see, the root word of, that's translated ungrateful, the root of that word comes from the word to be thankful, but it has a prefix on it of the letter A, which completely now negates the word. So A, thankful. People that are A, thankful, or in our terms, unthankful. Theologian William Barclay says, the strange characteristic of ingratitude is that it is the most hurting of all the sins because it is the blindest of all sins. Probably if you're an ungrateful person, what William Barclay is trying to say is you don't even see it. You don't even see it in yourself because you're so blind, the characteristic of ingratitude. So I was asking myself the question this week, what should I be grateful for? What are these benefits of God that David seems to tell his soul to not forget about? So this week of Thanksgiving, you and I can join David in giving thanks to God for five things that he lists out in these first five verses. We could give thanks for forgiveness. David writes in verse 3, who forgives all your iniquity. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Ever thought of what life would be like? If you had never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, who had never washed away your sins, uh, what would it be like if we somehow, I'm going to give you a hypothetical here, okay? What would it be like if we somehow reached the limit of God's forgiveness? Maybe you sinned one too many times, and you're in church. You're feeling convicted, and, and you pray, God, I'm sorry. And then later that day, there's a knock at your door, and it's a messenger from God, and he says, oh, by the way, God heard your prayer today, but uh, like strike 1,431, you're out. Sorry, bad luck, better chance in, in your next life. Not that we believe in reincarnation, that's kind of weird. 
But what would it be like if we somehow reached the limit of God's forgiveness and we were fresh out of God's love? No more saving grace for you because now you've gone one too many times. That's not what the psalmist is saying here. Some of you guys are looking at me really queer. I told you that was a hyperbat. Hypothetical. Listen, listen. Not only does he forgive all your iniquities, but listen to verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. You deserved death. You deserve separation, but he's not going to repay you what you deserved. Why? Because he forgives all, not some, not, not nine out of ten. He forgives all your iniquities. And in verse 12, th- this, this is a good one. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's a long way. That's an infinite distance as far, not just to the next town over, but as far as the east is, not just from the next town west, but as far as west. That's an infinite distance that he has removed our transgressions, our sins from us. Why? Because verse 3 says, who forgives all your iniquities. You see, so forgiveness shows up first in this order that the psalmist gives us to cultivate a grateful heart. What am I grateful for and what are the benefits that God has done for me that I don't want to forget about? I'm so thankful for God's forgiveness. Second in this list is healing. He says, who heals all your diseases. Perhaps you were sick this last week or this past month or this past year. Chances are some of you might have been very, very sick. And what's impressive to me is the psalmist doesn't say that God diagnoses all of your diseases. The doctor can do that. There are specialists that can not only, ju- not only diagnose the disease, but like they can put their finger on the root cause of what caused that disease. But they don't have the power to heal, and neither can any man. Only God can heal, and I'm so thankful that we have a God, as the psalmist says, who can heal all your diseases. And we understand that, and I'm looking at a room where so many people would be able to raise their hand and say, I've experienced the healing power of God in my life. And David, David means that, but I think he even goes a step further than just our physical healing, and you've got to understand who he's talking to with the word your, who heals all your diseases. Is he talking to the body, your disease? No, David's not speaking to the body. You gotta remember who is David speaking to. You go back to the beginning and it says, bless the Lord, O my soul. So he's talking to the soul and he's reminding the soul that there's a God who heals all your diseases. And he's talking about the inner diseases of our soul, things like hatred and division and pride and selfishness and envy and jealousy and anger and rage and stubbornness and selfishness, that feeling of revenge, of harboring that I'm going to get back at you kind of attitude, the psalmist says God has healed all those diseases. Remember the healing that God's done in your own life over this past year, and, and perhaps Perhaps it was a physical healing. Perhaps it was even deeper than that, and it was a heart disease that you had where there was revenge or anger. You wanted to get back at somebody or pride and jealousy. And you can say, God, thank you that you care about the ugliness of my heart, and you heal that too. We could be grateful for God's forgiveness and for his healing. Third, we can be grateful for God's protection. Verse 4. Another one of God's benefits, who redeems your life from the pit. 
The, the reference to the pit literally means to be in ruin or to be in destruction. And, and for David, the pit was the place of death or the place of destruction. And David praised God for rescuing him from death when death threatened him at every turn. Right? From David's earliest days, he, he had been a child of providence, that God was moving him in certain places and opening certain doors and protecting him. The word providence. I mean, there's so many stories that we have of David's narrowing escapes from the jaws of the lion, from the paw of the bear, from the sword of Goliath and the spear of Saul, from the armies of Absalom and from the forces of the Philistines, God delivered him time and time again. God stepped in and snatched David from the clutches of death and the pit. And no wonder he sings the song, who redeems your life from the pit. How close so many times he had been to death and destruction, and yet how many times God had rescued him, the strong arm of our God. You see, every person, you and I, that's alive today, we're alive because God has protected you from death and danger. You probably have stories, being in an automobile accident, or being diagnosed at just the right time. You probably have stories that include the words, but God. You see, all, all the way back to your earliest days, you're a miracle. Today, you are a walking miracle of moments where God has rescued you from death and destruction because you can join the psalmist in singing, God has rescued me from the pit. And then... David says in verse four, another one of God's benefits, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I'm so thankful that we have a God who loves us. That's his character. He is loving in all that he does. And the Hebrew, Hebrew word crown comes from the root that means to circle or to surround, that God's love surrounds you, that God's love is on every side. And David blessed God by praising him for his all-encompassing love that surrounds him. Like there's no place that I can turn that I don't run into God's love. I might be walking this way and I'm gonna run into God's love. I might be walking this way and I'm gonna run into God's love. That his love surrounds me. And there's a story that's told of a farmer who once mounted a weather vane on top of his barn you know, the things that kind of move around and show you the direction of the wind, right? And on it, he, 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 he wrote, God is love. And he's up there on the roof of his barn and he's mounting it on and it says, God is love. And the neighbor farmer comes over and he doesn't have, to, he doesn't have much for religious things and he's trying to be sarcastic. And, and so he looks up and he reads on the weather vane and says, God is love. And, and he, he kind of says, hey, do you mean that God's love is as changeable as the wind? And he said, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, no, said the farmer. It means that no matter which way the wind is blowing, God is still love. Doesn't matter if the wind is blowing good or if the wind's blowing bad, God is love. Doesn't matter if there's wind or if there's no wind, God is love. Because his unchanging character is love. You have a God who loves you. And you can't, you can't escape his love. And everywhere you turn around, you gotta, you got to trample over his love to, to get out of his will. He loves you so much. He encircles you with his love. And then last, as it's sort of a, a cherry on top of a beautiful banana split, David says in verse 5, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. You have a God that satisfies you with good. You lack nothing. He's given you everything that you need. He fills you with contentment. He satisfies you. David may have meant that God was always providing food for him, kind of like God did for the Israelites as they were wandering around in the desert. But in itself, 
as miraculous as manna or food might have been or even heavenly provision, and as much of grounds for thanksgiving that would be, I think there's even more that God has for you to satisfy the desires of your heart. I, I, I think the world that you and I live in struggles to understand that. Maybe we're playing a comparison game and there's something that somebody else has that we don't have and so it leaves us longing for more. I, I, I don't know why there's such a dissatisfaction in our world today, but I'm here to tell you that God satisfies you with good. Our world is running around searching, moaning, looking for this intangible something to to fit the whole of their soul and, and so their, their lives mimic and echo the song that Mick Jagger sings that you probably know it. When he says, I can't get no. Oh, you do, yeah. Well, we're going to have a sermon about what kind of music you're listening to. <laughs> right, can you see that in our world today? I can't get no satisfaction. And they're looking, they're searching, they jump in and out of relationships. This one didn't make me happy, so I'm going to jump, I'll try another one. In and out of jobs, this one didn't treat me the way I wanted to be treated. Can, can you see that in our world today? And yet the psalmist is coming alongside and he's saying that there's a God who understands you have a God-shaped hole inside of you that only God can fill, and so he satisfies you with good. Augustine says, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts find no rest till they rest in thee. You see, whatever you're trying to fill your life with, Sex, money, pleasures, accolades, titles, jobs, cars, people. None of that can satisfy the deepest hungers of our heart. Because only God can. So this week of Thanksgiving, when you're thinking of reasons to be grateful... Spend some few moments going over the list the psalmist gives us. I'm so grateful. I'm going to tell my soul, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Because he's a God who forgives and heals, protects and loves and satisfies, and I need for nothing. Let me invite you to bow your head with, close your eyes with me for just a moment.